Oops. Hi, Michelle Glass here, and we are still talking about our red blood cells, and we're picking up here with um, what I like to describe as the life cycle of red blood cells. So, so we're going to be talking about how those red blood cells are formed. We're going to be talking about, you know, basically how long they do their job, which is about 120 days. We've already mentioned that. And then we're going to see this process of how the body is going to recycle and remove the waste of those old worn out red blood cells. Now remember another name for our red blood cells um, is uh, an erythrocyte. So the process of making new red blood cells is called erythropoiesis. So that's where we're actually going to start our conversation. Now you already know from studying AMP1 that one of the jobs of the bone is to form our blood cells. So erythropoiesis is a process specific to our erythrocytes or red blood cells. This process is occurring in that space called the medullary cavity um, or the marrow cavity of your long bones. We can also talk about this as myeloid tissue. So you might see either of these names used. Oh, wrong button. Oops, again. Here we go. All right. Now this process of erythropoiesis is being coordinated by a hormone. That hormone you can see highlighted as erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is abbreviated EPO. So we're going to be introducing hormones all semester long. Their conversation was not limited to endocrine system. Every time we introduce a hormone, if it has an abbreviation, remember you need to know both the name and the abbreviation for that hormone. Now erythropoietin is going to be released when oxygen levels are low. So when oxygen levels are low, that will actually trigger the kidney and to some extent the liver, to release this hormone erythropoietin. Now what would cause your oxygen levels to be low? You could have anemia, and there are several causes of anemia. We mentioned if your diet is low in iron, that might lead to a form of anemia. You might have problems with blood flow to your kidney. So if your blood pressure is low, then you're not gonna have as much blood flowing to your kidney. So this kidney is going to respond as if your oxygen levels are low, and it's going to trigger the release of erythropoietin. If you're not getting enough um, oxygen from your air, so if you're at a high elevation and your respiratory system is working well, but there's just not a lot of oxygen in the air that you're breathing, then this might trigger the release of erythropoietin. Or if you have damage to your respiratory system, then that might cause you to not get the oxygen that you need. And so if your oxygen levels are low, that's going to trigger the kidney to release erythropoietin or EPO. So we can see there's lots of different reasons why we might have a decrease in oxygen level. Now what does EPO actually do? It's going to go to the bone marrow and it's going to trigger cell division in cells that are called erythroblasts. So I have those highlighted. We're going to be looking at erythroblasts in a few minutes as we look at the whole process of erythropoiesis. We'll also see that um, there's a whole process of maturing those red blood cells. So EPO will help to increase the maturation of those red blood cells and, also, and, and do that by increasing the hemoglobin production. So remember big H, little g, little b is an abbreviation for hemoglobin. You can also use big H, little b there. Okay? So again, if you're... Oxygen levels are low, kidney releases EPO. EPO is going to the bone marrow, increasing the production of the erythroblasts, um, increasing the maturation of red blood cells by speeding up their hemoglobin production. Okay. Now, what we will see is, again, all of your blood cells are starting out in the bone marrow, and we have a stem cell for all of those formed elements. Remember, formed elements include red blood cells, but also white blood cells and platelets. So we have a um, overall stem cell called the hemocytoblast. It's going to do a cell division to make a lymphoid stem cell and a myeloid stem cell. 
the lymphoid stem cell is going to be involved in the production of lymphocytes, and we're going to talk about that in chapter 22. So we can just kind of put a little bookmark there, and we'll come back to that idea later. The myeloid stem cell is going to give rise to your red blood cells and your white blood cells. So we're going to see that the myeloid stem cell gives rise to the proerythroblast, which then is going to go through lots of different developmental steps to become our mature red blood cell. So our job is to look at what's happening here to take us from that proerythroblast to our red blood cell. So we're going to be looking at this process in more detail. So we already mentioned our process is called erythropoiesis. We've already said that it's happening in the bone marrow, which we can also call the myeloid tissue. And we've already said that this process is orchestrated by the hormone erythropoietin, or EPO, which is going to be released when oxygen levels are low. What we see happening is the production of our proerythroblast. So this is going to be um, one of our early um, cells in the process of making a red blood cell. So that's day one. Okay, our proerythroblast is going to um, be busy making hemoglobin, and during this time frame where it's making hemoglobin, it's day two, day three. Um, we're going to, when it's finished, call it an erythroblast. So as we go through these different names, it's basically telling us where the cell is at the different stages of development. So the difference between the proerythroblast and the erythroblast is that the erythroblast has um, produced a lot of the hemoglobin that this cell needs to have. So it's further along in its development. On day four, the erythroblast is going to be called our normal blast. And it's at this point that it kicks out the nucleus and those other organelles. So we see that it needs to have most of its hemoglobin produced um, by the time it gets to be a normal blast because then it's kicking out those directions for how to make more hemoglobin. And it's also going to be kicking out eventually the machinery to make that hemoglobin. Initially, what we see is that there are still some of those messenger RNAs in the cell. So at, at this stage, when the nucleus is kicked out, it's called a reticulocyte. It has about 80% of the hemoglobin molecule that it needs, but it does still have the mRNA to make additional hemoglobin, but that mRNA lasts a few days and then it degrades and we don't have the DNA molecule to make more mRNA to make more hemoglobin. Um, the reticulocyte is going to be finishing up that production of uh, hemoglobin um, and it's gonna take about one to three days for that to happen. Okay. So again, we're going through our process of erythropoiesis, formation of our red blood cells, is happening at the bone marrow, it's being orchestrated by the hormone EPO when oxygen levels are low. It starts with our proerythroblast, which is going to be busy for a couple days making hemoglobin. Once we are at day three, we call it an erythroblast. Once we're at day four, we call it a normal blast. At that stage of normal blast, that's when we kick out our nucleus. Once we have our cell without the nucleus, we call it the reticulocyte. The reticulocyte has about 80% of the um, total hemoglobin in the cell. We see that it's at that stage of a reticulocyte for a few days, where it's continuing that production of hemoglobin. And then at day seven, it's going to be released into the bloodstream. So it's released into the bloodstream as a reticulocyte. So it's not yet a mature red blood cell. It has to be in circulation for 24 hours before it becomes a fully functioning red blood cell. So we see that there's enzymes in the circulation that are helping to actually finish up that maturation process. Once we have our mature red blood cell, then we can think about it as doing, um, doing its job. Erythropoiesis, we've said already, is orchestrated by the hormone EPO, erythropoietin. But it's not just dependent on the production of EPO. We have to have other components in order to successfully 
have this process occur in our body. So we need things from our diet. So clearly, we're going to be making a lot of hemoglobin. It's a protein. It's a building block. It's amino acids. So we need to have plenty of amino acids from our diet in order to build this molecule. We've already mentioned that there is an iron at the center of each heme group. There are four heme groups in each hemoglobin molecule. A mature red blood cell has about 280 total hemoglobin molecules. So we need um, quite a bit of iron um, in order to complete those molecules. And then we also see that there are vitamins that are required in this process as well. So we need vitamins B12, B6, and folic acid in order to complete erythropoiesis. So sometimes um, our diet is rich in amino acids and we don't have any problems with iron, but some individuals do have trouble getting vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is something that we get typically by eating animal products. So sometimes vegetarians or vegans uh, may have trouble getting enough B12 out of their diet, so that can be an issue. But also what we see is that your small intestine has to produce what's called intrinsic factor in order to absorb the vitamin B12 from your diet. So if you are eating enough vitamin B12 but you're not producing the intrinsic factor, it's not going to enter your bloodstream, it's not going to be available for your body to use to make more red blood cells. So this is why sometimes people get vitamin B12 injections or they use like the sublingual vitamin B12. Sublingual, of course, means under your tongue. So if you stick it under your tongue, then in that case, the B12 is being absorbed directly um, into those capillaries at the bottom of the tongue. And so you're bypassing the digestive tract in that case. There are individuals who do not produce um, intrinsic factor or do not produce enough intrinsic factor. And so this can lead to a type of anemia called pernicious anemia. So pernicious anemia is coming from um, the lack of vitamin B12, which again could be dietary, you're not eating enough B12, or it could be that your body is not producing um, that intrinsic factor. Okay, going back to this picture, We've already talked through our process of erythropoiesis. And then we've already mentioned that our cells are going to be busy transporting oxygen gas and carbon dioxide gas for about 120 days. And they're squeezing through those teeny tiny little capillaries. Um, and they do not have nuclei, and they do not have ribosomes, and they're traveling about 700 miles um, around the cardiovascular system in that 120 days. So of course they're gonna get damaged and they're gonna get old and they're, they're not able to repair. And so we see that it's gonna be important to be able to recycle um, and remove the waste from these damaged cells. So here is our process. Okay, now there's really two things that can happen. In our spleen in particular, we have our macrophage. Our macrophage is that big phagocytic cell. So here I've drawn it. Ah, looks like a little, um, what you call it, Pac-Man. And um, you have all these macrophage in the spleen and they can actually recognize, hey, this red blood cell is getting old and damaged and the macrophage can actually phagocytize it. And then we do have some cells that actually rupture in circulation before they're able to be phagocytized. And so if your blood cells are rupturing, we call that hemolysis. And the problem here is it makes it hard to capture and recycle components of our hemoglobin molecule. So it's really better if that macrophage can find and phagocytize those red blood cells before they burst. Even after you have some hemolysis occurring, some of that, those components can be um, phagocytized, so you can still reclaim some of it, but then also some of that hemoglobin molecule will be eliminated in the urine, so that's just lost um, by the body. So we're gonna see about 10% of the time hemolysis happens, and then about 90% of the time, we're able to phagocytize those old, worn out red blood cells. Now, when that happens inside the macrophage, 
we're going to see that that hemoglobin molecule is broken down into these three components and different stuff happens for each of these. So we're going to um, break down the heme, we're going to break down into amino acids, and we're going to break um, that iron out of that heme group. Our iron, remember, has to be there um, in order to actually bind oxygen. So this is sort of precious. And so we'll see that the body is going to keep it um, when possible. So that iron will actually move into the bloodstream. It'll be paired with a transporter called transferrin, which takes it back to the bone marrow so that it's available there for all those new red blood cells that are busy making hemoglobin. Our amino acids are going to have a similar sort of um, recycling, right? So the amino acid components are going to make their way to the bloodstream. They can then be used by the bone marrow to build more of those subunits, um, but they can be used really by any cells um, that are needing to make protein. So those amino acids should be reused by the body. It's the heme group that is actually processed as a waste product. So we're still inside our macrophage, inside the spleen, and the heme is converted to a molecule called biliverdin, which is named because it has a greenish color, so verde is green. And then the biliverdin is gonna be converted to kind of an orangish colored molecule called bilirubin. So these pigments um, are visible in the molecules. The bilirubin is going to leave the macrophage, leave the spleen, and travel in the um, bloodstream. And it's going to combine with albumin protein. It's going to then make its way to the liver. So bilirubin was produced as a byproduct of the breakdown of heme at the macrophage, um, or in the macrophage at the spleen that bilirubin is released into circulation, it's picked up by the liver, and it becomes a component of bile. Bile is gonna make its way um, to the small intestine via a bile duct. So we'll talk about that in the, in the um, digestive tract. So now the bilirubin has made its way from the spleen to the liver to the small intestine. Once it gets to the large intestine, we have some important gut bacteria that will break it down into two different molecules, urobilins and stercobilins. The urobilins can make their way back into the bloodstream, be processed by the kidney, and leave in the urine, and they are contributing to the yellowish color of our urine. The stercobilins are going to stay in the large intestines, become part of the fecal material, and they are contributing to the brownish color, brownish orangish color of fecal material. Okay, so the key things. We're recycling the hemoglobin out of our red blood cells. This is happening inside the macrophage at the spleen. The hemoglobin is composed of three major components. So we have an iron, we have amino acids, we have our heme. Iron is going to go into the bloodstream, pair with transferrin, which will go to the bone marrow so that it can be reused in the production of more hemoglobin. The amino acids will make their way to the bloodstream. They're the building blocks of protein, so any cells making proteins can use these amino acids, including those um, cells doing erythropoiesis in the bone marrow. The heme is waste the heme has to be removed. So we see inside the macrophage that the heme is converted to biliverdin, which is converted to bilirubin, which makes its way via the bloodstream to the liver. At the liver, it is um, leaving in the bile to make its way to the small intestine, large intestine, and then out of the body. Now, bilirubin, has to be processed at the liver and converted into bile. So if your liver is not functioning correctly, then you might see some of this coloration from the bilirubin accumulating in the integumentary system. So you might see orangish color to skin or to the sclera of your eyes, we call that jaundice. This can happen in newborns. So sometimes infants um, don't quite have fully functioning liver, and so they have accumulation of the bilirubin 
in their integumentary system. Usually you treat that with some um, light. So there's special UV light boxes, or you can just have a little bit of sun exposure, put them in a sunny window, and that can help their integumentary system break down that um, buildup of bilirubin. And typically after a couple days, then you know their liver is able to take care of that normally. If you have liver damage or diseased liver, then you might see jaundice happening there um, because again, the liver is not able to keep up with the process of bilirubin. Okay, and that is it for now. So stay tuned for the rest of our formed elements.